off of there. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. I am speaking to you now from approximately uh, about a half second in the future. <laughs> I am, of course, the Mighty Pong. I'm Crux. And our special guests tonight are... Uh, Zenify. And... Ugly Man. Fantastic. Now, we have an action-packed show for you tonight. Uh, despite the fact that uh, my video is lagged out for some reason, I don't know. Uh, we are going to be talking about a tale of two copyrights. One of electronic circuits, the other of audio. Now, if you guys were around for, uh, let's see, about five episodes ago, it was episode, I want to say 18, uh, called A Lot of If Statements, we got a copyright uh, violation. Not a strike, it's the other thing. I can't remember what it was. But we got one of those. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in the second half. And it was awesome. But first, before we go there, uh, an announcement on the shop. Uh, we are, of course, located at 1075 American Pacific Drive, and that's Sweet C in fabulous Henderson, Nevada. Uh, now, unless you remember, you're going to have to wait a little bit to come check out the shop. Uh, right now, we're closed to the public. But we'd like to remind you that while we're closed to the public, you are in a shared space elsewhere. Make sure that you clean all of your tools, surfaces, and materials before and after you use them. Uh, make sure that you do what you can in order to uh, limit exposure uh, and uh, to yourself and others. Stay home. Don't touch your face. And for Pete's sake, wash your damn hands. So uh, through everybody helping yeah, out a little bit. Wear a mask when you're out in public. You know what? I, I haven't added that yet. Yes. Yeah. Wear a mask when you're out in public, for the love of God. Uh, but yes. Like, I'll just go ahead and finish your thing. No, that's fine. So to, to stay updated on the shop's open status, you can head over to sinshop.org forward slash COVID status, and you can find out the latest information there. And to make sure you're notified of our future events, including virtual ones just like this, you can join us at meetup.com forward slash sin shop. So, a tale of two copyrights. So before we get to the uh, the stuff of our uh, our copyright junk, I want to introduce our guest here. Uh, this is Ugly Man. How did you find out about the shop, first of all? You know, I was doing research uh, before moving here. I moved here a year and a half ago, and I had had about a, a year where I knew I was coming down, and so I had done research, and so I knew about the shop then. Uh, I had kind of known that uh, that would be one of the places we would uh, go check out when we got here, and mm -hmm. uh, pleasantly surprised to find what we found there. Awesome. So about a year and a half you guys have known about then? Yeah, something like that. Very cool. So what's your favorite thing about the shop? Like, what's kept you coming back? I think that, uh, you know, I haven't, uh, you know, moving here, things are a little chaotic when you move and all of that. And so I haven't been settled in and doing projects and stuff like that. But what what we have gained is, you know, some of the first friendships that we made here in town were there. I uh, have had such, you know, great conversations there and have learned uh, a lot just from kind of chatting with people around there. So it's been uh, it's been a huge benefit to us so far. That's really cool. Yeah, I you, I think you first told me the story that you're about to tell our guests. You told that to me, I would say, probably about a year ago, wasn't it? And That could be about right. Yeah, so, so I used to use Mackie stuff a lot. And uh, you know, ever since, actually, I think ever since I started the show, I've been thinking about having you on. And, and, and this, this uh, whole copyright thing provided the perfect opportunity to have you on because yours, your story about the early days of Mackie dovetails perfectly. Well, I guess kind of the end times of Mackie, uh, but do dovetailed perfectly uh, with our copyright story that we're, that we're having here. So, um, so it's going to be fantastic to, to hear this. So, so I'm going to stop talking here, set the stage for us. When and where are we talking about here? Okay. So um, I grew up in uh, Bothell, Washington, North of Seattle, uh, one town over is Woodenville. Uh, Woodenville had a valley full of electronics factories and things like that. Uh, there's, there was uh, medical devices, there was audio electronics, there was all kinds of stuff like that. And growing up in the 80s and 90s, if if you were up there, uh, you know, near Microsoft, near Amazon, near all these things that were, you know, the dot com craziness. You know, if you had any interest in electronics or computers, you were certainly encouraged to go down that road. And, uh, you know, I was interested in all of that. You know, I was an electronics hobbyist when I was a kid and I was a guitar player. And at some point I was looking at a guitar magazine in the mid 90s and I saw a Mackie advertisement for that 1202 mixer that 
you know, was the first mixer that a regular person could afford to put in their bedroom and, uh, you know, really had good quality. Mm -hmm. And so it was really exciting uh, to see the address at the bottom of that was uh, just over in Woodenville. I knew I wanted to work there. And I I actually picked up the phone and called them and tried to get a job there. And they said, well, you know, you have to be uh, 18 to work here. And I wasn't yet. So I stayed in touch. I kept calling them back, kept sending them resumes and trying to get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, that late nineties era was, you know, Mackie was booming. They were selling those compact mixers like crazy. Uh, this company I eventually learned had been started in Greg Mackey's uh, condo and a guy that became, you know, one of my best friends in the world just passed away, uh, in the last year or so was Tom Johnson. And he was one of Greg Mackey's first employees that sat in his three bedroom condo making audio mixers. When I worked there, um, you know, about 2000, I got a job there. I worked there for a couple of years until they moved the factory to China. Uh, but when I worked there, uh, they were rolling out the Mackie digital products. And um, it was, uh, you know, shifting gears, trying to make things work. And they were up against this battle that we're going to talk about uh, and some other, you know, sort of conditions in the marketplace at the time. Yeah. So I was actually thinking about that. Uh, when was that? I guess yesterday or earlier today about back whenever I was first uh, getting into music and all that stuff, Mackie was the, to me, was the first like professional grade stuff that was attainable, not easily attainable. It wasn't cheap, but it was attainable. Like if I had enough successful gigs or if I, you know, mowed lawns or, you know, did enough telemarketing, I could afford a Mackie mixer and have something that was really, really solid. I talked about that a little bit on, uh, on last Monday, uh, on our, uh, we did a, we do a project stream on Mondays at seven 30, uh, Pacific as well. Um, but, uh, I w- was talking a little bit about the, you know, some of the designs, like the way that they do the, uh, the way they have the pots supported, you know, going directly into the circuit board rather than coming in from the side at a 90 degree angle. Uh, what, what, what else set them apart at the time? Like just to kind of, so, so people understand like what we had essentially. Yeah. Um, some, some of what made Mackie unique was the fact that they were, that they were made in America in a state of the art factory with, uh, you know, some extremely skilled people working on that, on that stuff. It was, it was really, uh, a, a sort of a bizarre thing by today's standards. It's it's not something that you would see now that, you know, a, a $400, $500 audio mixer would be made by the level of skill that was in that factory. Uh, we had a state-of-the-art metal shop that, you know, was, from what I understand, was kind of world-renowned for some of the things that we were doing in that metal shop. You have to be extremely precise when you stamp out the chassis for a for an audio mixer because you know a a 32.8 had something like 500 knobs on it so you had to cut 500 little holes if you could cut them tighter uh to fit around the 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 shafts of those pots uh you wouldn't get as much dust into the in into those pots and so uh getting those tolerances as tight as possible and then you add a little bit of paint you add a little bit of silk screen there's all these opportunities to mess up that tolerance the precision that was going on there considering that these were you know, relatively inexpensive products was really something that had never been done before for the audio industry. So what was the, uh, what made that happen? How do I put this? What made that possible? Was it, uh, automation of the factory? Was it, you know, just, or just people that were really good at drilling holes? Like what was it that made that possible? So they really, by the time I worked there, uh, they had a lot of automation in that metal shop and actually, a. Uh, one of the mechanics over there pulled me aside. It was it was uh, probably the summer of 2000, and he said, "Have you ever had a tour of our metal shop?" I said, "No." And he took me over there, and I was excited to see it. It was in we had about four buildings there. There was two big buildings that were entirely Mackie, and then we had kind of partial spaces uh, for the service shop for for warranty support and stuff like that. Um, and there was design engineering area down there too, but. We went over to the metal shop, which was also the building where they built the speakers, like the SRM 450s and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And we um, and the HR 824s, the little studio monitors that everybody loved. Oh. And uh, I, the, I see <laughs> whenever whenever I'd go to a show and they had those Mackie stage monitors. Oh, it, that that made my night. I tell you, like that was. Wow. 
I personally built and tested a lot of the uh, SRM 450s. Uh, that was a miserable line to work on because the tester had to actually empty those things out of the box that were stacked taller than me. I'm mm. a pretty tall guy, and you had to empty those boxes and get those things on the line. Then you had to run to the far end of the assembly line to test them. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the line was designed that way, but um, anyway. Efficiency. Those, those, yeah, <laughs> those, it was efficient for somebody, just not for the tester. Right. But, uh, yeah. oh, it was it was a fantastic product. It was, it was uh, those were great. Absolutely. Yeah. For anyway, I was, I was saying about the metal shop, the, the mechanic, my anecdote about the sort of level of technology that they had at the time, the mechanic told me that at night, if he was on call, if he was the official guy on call, it would automatically know, you know, how to get a hold of him. And it would actually call him and this robotic sort of voice would tell him, I need more metal. And he would know that he needs to drive down there and get on the forklift and load some more magazines of metal into that machine. Wow. It, to do <laughs> that. To do that now is not impressive at all, but to do that, I mean, you could do that for 50 bucks from Home Depot now or whatever, but back then in 2000, that was a, a kind of a, a remarkable, quirky design. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say 20 years ago, you know, it, that's a little yeah. bit more than a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, cool. oh, go ahead. I was, I was pretty cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I never really thought about that. I've I have servers that would message me or something like that saying if they're okay, but not like a call. Yeah. And I, I, I can give you an idea just, just quickly the, the, that metal shop, it had magazines of metal. These, these huge magazines of sheet metal would come in. It's like a pallet of metal. They would slap that in with a forklift. It would run through the first machine and it was like an amazing process where one die would come down and stamp, uh, all the holes for multiple mixer chassis. It was it was like a, a grid of audio mixers would just appear right before your eyes when that machine wow. stamped it. It would roll to the next uh, part of the machine and then it would automatically fold the sides. And then a guy would just pick those up and hang them on a hook and it would go through the paint shop, which would take that hook, I think, 24 hours uh, to go through the paint shop. Uh, to go through all the steps. And, and then a, a guy at the end would pull it off that hook and put it on the silkscreen machine. Uh, and that was how all of those were built. That's amazing. Hmm. So did having all that in house lead to them being able to innovate faster? Because that's one thing I heard with, with like Adafruit, one of the reasons they put all their manufacturing in Brooklyn is because they got tired of the back and forth between them and, you know, dealing with overseas. So did, did that help innovation wise? So my role with the company, I came in and, and worked a little short time as an assembler, and then I worked as a, a tester, uh, you know, final tester, and, and I got pulled in to do the pilot runs on the digital products. And so I, just by luck, I happened to, you know, come into the company with some computer experience, and they were doing the HDR 2496 was the was the 24-track uh, digital recording. Uh, it was hard disk recording. It was It was a new idea at the time, sort of. And so that was because kind of, we, did, we sorry, did good on that pilot run. Super fast. Uh, was that basically competing with like the Roland VS 880, I want to say? Uh, I don't know what model numbers or whatever, but yeah, oh. there was there were similar products at the time. The yeah. HDR came out about 2000. I tested the first 50 units or so off the line. That's and then I trained the other testers and worked with them for the first couple thousand. Uh, at that point, we were, I, I ended up, testing i think pretty much all of the digital products i tested the pilot runs uh for all their new products for the next couple of years hmm. just for the digital stuff i did some analog testing for 32.8 and stuff like that the the analog boards but um and i did some 1604s and some other things too but yeah the hard disk recorder it was the hdr and then the mdr and then the sdr and what was interesting was you asked about that uh innovation part they started buying companies around this time uh, Things were kind of in a tailspin um, at, at that at that moment, you know, in, in time. And so they were buying, uh, I think, Acuma Labs in Belgium, if I remember right. RCF uh, was a transducer manufacturer in Italy, mm. EAW in Chicago. Those acquisitions happened while I was there. And I sort of saw, you know, some of it was buying sort of the ability to make these new things. Man. We had a sync board in the HDR that came from Acuma that I don't think we would have been able to make in-house. And EAW, I have not heard that, you know, like uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, meme. <laughs> now there's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> yeah. 
EAW. I remember those. Those were decent. They weren't. They weren't nearly as phenomenal as as the Mackie stuff was, but they were decent. It's my understanding that they made the actual speakers that went in the SRM four hundred and fifty, and that was why we bought them. Oh, okay, all right. And the transducers came from RCF, and the housings I think came from RCF. If I remember right, when we were pulling those SRM four hundred and fifties off the pallet to uh, mount the amplifier, the amplifier was made in Woodenville, hmm. uh, and we would put that all together on the assembly line but the speakers came pre-mounted in the housings and i think that they had already visited italy and chicago before they got to us maybe or maybe the speakers from chicago were sent to italy there was some story like that of how that worked i can't remember now wow so what was the advantage of sending them you know from here to there i guess it, it, that happened to be where they already had the speaker manufacturing place and the other place already had the amplifier stuff because they were uh, just to just to fill in anybody that's not familiar with the speakers that we're talking about, uh, if you go to a wedding, a lot of times uh, these are the kind of speakers that you'll see on two poles on either side of the DJ. That's the kind of speakers that we're talking about. They're basically stage monitors, but some do, some people do use them as PA's. And and the the particular model that he's talking about, you would have no problem using them to to provide. So sound they have for... an amplifier built in, or exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with that yeah. style. Yeah, I I don't know why they did it that way, but I think that it had to do with um, you know, logistics was different 20 years ago than it is now, and I think that uh, Mackie Products entered the distribution channel sort of from that Woodenville warehouse, and I think it made sense to sort of finish them up there and have us look at them, mm. uh, have the regular testers do them. They they were building the amplifiers in our factory. And and like everything that we did pretty much there, almost everything that we did there was, you know, components were hand loaded onto those circuit boards. The flow solder machines were there. We had the, the surface mount soldering department did all of that work there. That was all in-house stuff. There's about 600 people, give or take, working there when I was there, I think. So uh, I was going to ask that. So there were about 600 people at that at that. Like that's the number that I remember going around and I don't know if that included like the warranty department and the design engineers. I don't know if, you know, it was, it was probably between 550 and 800, but the number of people always said was 600. Wow. Very cool. Well, that's awesome. So what was it, what was the atmosphere like at the time? Was it, you know, like, was everybody living high on the hog, but well, you were saying that they would already start to have some problems. Like what, what started to happen? What started going wrong? It's a weird moment in my sort of time, personal timeline because it was a dream come true for me. Uh, but things had already started to go wrong by the time I was there. You know, people that I met early on would sort of pull me aside and be like, oh, you know, you missed the good old days when Greg Mackey would walk around and hand $100 bills to everybody or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, I got to know a lot of those stories because my friend Tom that I mentioned before, you know, I spent a lot of nights... Uh, you know, having a few drinks with Tom and his uh, condo in Woodenville there right down the road from the factory. And he told me all those stories of how it, because he had seen the entire, you know, rise and fall of the company. He was there for the whole ride. And so I got a lot of insight into how that all went. And it, it had been everybody's dream come true at, at one point. Um, but, you know, for me, I wanted to work there because I was a guitar player. But more than that, I wanted to work there because it was electronics. And I loved electronics. And mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid and, and I would look in those electronics magazines and I'd see an advertisement for an oscilloscope and they'd have some lab coat guy standing next to it. I think that's what I want to do when I grow up. I didn't know what that job was. Well, I ended up having that job when I was about 19 and I was working as a tester in that factory. I had all that test gear that I'd always dreamed of was right in front of me and I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but things were starting to change. The, the, the factory was a very upbeat, happy place to work. Uh, it was about 95% Southeast Asian people working there. Mm -hmm. The lines were sort of divided by language a little bit. So I worked with a, a Laotian family on the HDR line uh, and uh, ate grandma's sticky rice a couple times a day and, and just uh, had a great time, uh, you know, just so much to learn in a, in a situation like that. Uh, it was just, it was awesome. Uh, but it wasn't too long before, you know, we were delisted from the NASDAQ and there was, you know, layoffs starting and a factory spinning up in China and all that other stuff was sort of looming. Yeah. And the whole time I worked there, we kind of knew maybe that was coming. Uh, but it was, uh, it was great times uh, up until it actually started to happen. Sure. 
So what was your first sign that, that things were starting to go a little bit sideways? You know, we were believing that those digital products were going to change the course of the company and sort of save us. Like the people working on the floor, I think, uh, you know, the digital eight bus was a real revolutionary piece that was there before I was there. Uh, the HDR 2496 sort of was when they were getting into a whole line of digital products. So real quick, I they just, thought, I think that that was going to swing things in the right direction. Real quick. Uh, I just want to, I just want to like for, for historical purposes here, just, yeah. to, just to, just to, cause right now, you can pop, I can pop open my Chromebook and record, I can't do eight streams simultaneously, but you know what I'm saying. I can pop yeah. up just about any any notebook and, and have eight different streams recording. But 20 Absolutely. years ago, your best bet for doing that was probably going to be like to tape at that time. You know, you could, I guess you could mix eight tracks through a mixer, but as far as recording each of eight tracks separately and being able to do it digitally, that just wasn't a thing at the time, right? So what he's... Yeah. What he's talking about is is a big flipping deal. Like I remember when that and the VS eight eighty, a buddy of mine worked at a music store in Kansas City and he had a VS eight eighty and it was freaking revolutionary at the time, right? because uh, you know, just, I just wanted to make sure that like like cause saying, Oh yeah, we could record eight channels at once, people were like, Okay, and you know, so I just wanted to make yeah. sure that, that people understood at twenty years ago, that was a big deal. But anyway, well, go ahead. And, and I can give you an idea that, that product cost about $5,000. Yeah. Uh, plus, you'd have to buy some IO cards and stuff. It was one of the more expensive products that Mackie ever came up with. But the thing about it was, was that it could record at 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. It could re record all 24 tracks at the same time. Mm -hmm. This was, with, I think, if I remember right, it was like a 433 Celeron processor. Um, so that's a pretty impressive thing. It had a custom operating system that our guys had come up with. It was a very uh, new world. Uh, and it, and they had a lot of problems growing into the sort of digital side of things because this was a company that had only ever designed analog things. They had never dealt with ESD before. They had mm. never had electrostatic discharge be an issue on any of the components that, they, you know, you don't build an analog mixer out of very sensitive stuff. So, right. it, you know, they were having problems with what do you mean this is the wrong kind of plastic for these bins that the parts sit in and all of that kind of stuff? And I, We've been keeping our through-hole resistors in this metal bin for the past 10 yeah. years. You know, what's the problem? Yeah. Yeah. Never caused a problem. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, the and that thing could do 96 kilohertz uh, for 12 tracks, I think. Uh, it yeah. couldn't do 24. So double CD quality, which, again, at the time, you know, to have a computer that could even touch that, I'm not a hundred percent sure you could. I'm not sure what they were even doing with 96 at the time. Maybe some sort of video thing. I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of. Or if you're, uh, you know, if anybody in the chat uh, has the answer to this, please do let us know. Cause I'm, I'm super curious. Cause when, when I was coming up at the time, you know, I was recording things to dat tape to send off to have pressed. So I didn't really didn't care that much. I mean, yes, at 96K, yes, you're getting technically double the resolution of a CD. But, eh, I guess it's like trying to punk your audiophile friend that says did he can tell when something's digital. I don't know. Yeah, and, you know, the HDR had a, a video output where it had a little kind of point-and-click interface that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. They came up with the MDR, which was the same product, it just didn't have the video card in it. It had a little software tweak, and it was much less expensive. Hmm. But uh, it was actually pretty much the same thing inside. Uh, then they came up with the SDR. In that two-year period, all those products came out uh, You know, while I was working there. But the SDR, um, that was when it shifted. It was no longer an iTox motherboard with a Celeron processor. That was all custom Mackie circuit boards that we were making in-house. That was all stuff that was being manufactured right there in front of us. Oh, that's amazing. So, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I didn't know if you had something. No, I just said, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so having all that there, the, it was, so I guess going back to what I was saying before, having all that stuff in-house did let them iterate again and again and again. So you, oh, that's where we left off. You had said that people were talking, uh, were saying that that was going to be what saved the, comp the company. People were like, oh, yeah. 
this new thing. This is going to put us on the map, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, we know that it, uh, it was revolutionary. We know that, that especially at that price point, there was nothing else like it. So, so what happened? Well, so there was a number of things that happened right around that time. And if you were involved with electronics manufacturing at the time, you know that a couple of the big forces was the shift to, you know, WTO and NAFTA took place around then where now a lot of these factories moved to China. There was, um, you know, there was uh, our competitors uh, that, you know, always were, were trying to make it hard on us. They uh, went to China, you know, everybody went to China in the same year. It was uh, really interesting to see because we thought we had job security or career security sort of being in audio electronics in the Northwest where we were, even in Woodenville, you know, Symmetrics and Sunfire and all these other com companies were just kind of right down the road. And we always heard that our buddies would get hired there after working at Mackey. It was no big deal. They'd, they'd get jobs at these other places. They all went to China in the same year. Wow. The contract manufacturing houses that were uh, doing, you know, the products that couldn't immediately go to China because of engineering issues, those contract houses, they went to Mexico when NAFTA started. So there was going to be this shift coming, but one of Mackey's sort of major, you know, points of success was that factory that we talked about that was right next to the engineers in Woodenville. So. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to have the design engineer walk into the factory and tap a tester on the shoulder like me and say, how does it sound? That's a huge advantage that they were taking advantage of all the way through the 90s. Uh, but at the same time, we had 9-11 was a big issue for audio because it was a big issue for the entertainment industry. So, you know, there's a lot of things that changed with 9-11 and the recession that happened after it. The dot-com thing probably had a little bit of effect. There's all these sort of forces going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, one of the big ones was this, uh, this issue that you kind of want to talk about. Well, actually, b before we get to, to that, I did want to circle back because everybody's <laughs> heard of WTO and everyone's heard of NAFTA and all that stuff. What policy... Thing. Or if you don't know this, that's totally cool. Like you're, 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 we're here to talk manufacturing, not necessarily, you know, policy or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah. But but what specific thing was it that that flipped the dial to where everyone just all of a sudden dumped all their stuff into China at once? Like, so when I was uh, probably I'm, I'm not an expert on this. Sure. I mean, at the time I was a dumb kid working in a factory and drinking too much and, yeah. and having the time of my life. But um, I think we know, all the, were thing about that was uh it changed uh the way that goods could be imported into the country it did sort of uh changed you know i i believe it sort of changed how the tariffs were charged and things like that so that it made it financially viable to seek out the the cheaper factories over there and the cheaper labor it's my understanding that the guy who got my job i was making about 150 dollars a day at the time and i think he made 150 dollars a month uh, i was working you know, 10 hour days and he was working 14 to 16 hours a day and living in the factory. So it was a very different situation over there. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so, so is essentially, well, I mean, it, it, it's always the money, but on this one specifically, it was, it was the money. So uh, real quick, I just want to take a, a, a super quick break. We're, we're talking here with ugly man uh, about the, the downfall of, of Mackie and specifically about copyright, and that's the point we're going to get to in just, just a quick second here. But I did want to let everybody know uh, uh, that uh, if you want to find out more information about the shop, uh, go over to sinshop.org, and you can find out about our, our physical space where you yourself can go and, and work on projects. It's, it's freaking awesome. Uh, and also find out, uh, you know, not only when we're open, but also, you know, what kind of equipment we have, stuff like that. Uh, also, uh, we are uh, monitoring the uh, chat. I do want to say a big thanks to McNutNut, who has uh, subscribed with Tw Twitch Prime. We appreciate it immensely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, also, uh, you know, if you've got any uh, comments for us, please leave it in the chat and we will definitely read it. And uh, if you'd like to ask any questions of our guest, anything like that, that would be awesome as well. And also, don't forget, in, in the second half, in the post game, we are going to talk about how I almost got us in a lot of trouble. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be... Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Oh, yes, and we have another subscription from Akeen. Thank you so much for, to Akeen. Thank you for subscribing. We really, really appreciate it. All right, so coming back to, to what we were talking about here. Copyright. Here we go. Behringer. 
Dun, dun, dun. I thought about putting that on the soundboard, but I really hate soundboards at this point. Okay, so... <laughs> Oh, does he, do you guys have any, anything to ask before we go forward? Oh, no. Okay. Not really. I was just like, at first, I didn't even know what Mackie was. <laughs> I'm just like, I was, I was like, all right, this going to be a brand new story for me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So they, they, made the, uh, they made the sound card that all this is running through, but they used to make really good mixers. In fact, uh, that is a Mackie mixer right there. You can see it right there. Boop, Mackie mixer. Oh. That's one of the newer ones. And that reminds does me. It, does it say Mackie on it, or does it just have the little logo? It just has the logo. I wanted to ask you about that. Do you know the story behind that? I don't know, but I heard a rumor that, um, you know, this this company, since I worked there, has been, you know, it was acquired by Loud Technologies, and, you know, they acquired a whole bunch of companies, and, and they, they've they done a whole bunch of products, uh, you know, all manufactured in China, as far as I'm aware. Um, a few of my old friends still work there and stuff. I, and I'm in a Facebook group where at one point somebody told the sad story that one of these manufacturing contracts, they somehow managed to sign over the rights to the name Mackie. And so now the boards can't say Mackie. They just say the little running man logo instead. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what mine has. It's a Mackie mixer, but it doesn't say Mackie anywhere on it. It's, it's yeah, it, I heard that story on Facebook and I thought that can't be true. And I went straight to a guitar center. Like I, I closed my laptop and went to guitar center and I looked on the shelf and I saw a whole bunch of things that said designed in Woodenville, manufactured in China. And it had the Mackie logo, but not the name. And I just, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm still kind of struggling with that whole thing. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta find out for us, like, you know, if, if you can, like what, you know what the heck happened there because that's that's got to be the biggest screw up i've ever heard of is someone well okay maybe second but someone just signing away their company's name that's just ridiculous <laughs> like, i don't hard. know how it yeah. happens <laughs> oh my god yeah I, my guess is, is that somewhere in the world there's mixers that say mackie and look just like the mackie mixer that's at guitar center <sighs> um and are probably made in the same factory and probably they don't get a piece of that action. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. So the, the main, well, not the, not, but yeah, the main event, I guess, Behringer. So what happened with them? So you, you, we've got just to set the stage here, we've got all the jobs they're going over overseas. And then here comes Behringer. Is it, did, it, do I have the timeline, right? Was it, was it everybody starts making stuff over there and then, so I don't, I, it's my understanding, I I came in in the middle of the Behringer drama, and I don't know, um, because I was sort of oblivious to all of it. I was just excited to be there, and, and I was, you know, really diving into learning what I what my job was and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it really was, the, you know, one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had as far as, you know, just a job where you go every day and learn more stuff. And at some point I heard somebody talking about this Behringer deal and, you know, it, it's a complicated story that I don't know when that started, but Behringer, as far as I'm aware, had always been a China, you know, manufacturing their stuff in China. I don't know if they ever manufactured anything, you know, in the U S. Um, I think they were a German they, company, so it would have been Germany, but still even, even yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Mackie had the 1604, uh, was one of their best selling products. It was a, it was a 16 channel, you know, uh, you know, four, four bus mixer or whatever. It was a, a great little unit for a great price. Yep. And it was the thing that every, you know, just sort of bedroom musician wanted next to their, next to their rig. It was just such a great device and, um, had all kinds of sort of professional level capabilities. And all of a sudden, Behringer came out with a product that was just very much the same and was uh, made in China. And it, uh, the problem was is that it was so the same. Um, it turned out that it was actually pretty much identical. Um, and so then, you know, there was some suspicion, there was some stuff went on, and, and it was eventually determined that this was, you know, reverse engineered Mackie Mixer that was just manufactured in a different factory and was the exact same product. So how does how does a company actually do that? How does a company you okay, I get you go to the store and you buy one and you take it back to the lab and you disassemble it, but how does one copy well, I mean, I don't want to give away the the story that you're going to probably tell in a little bit, 
Um, yeah. But how does one copy things like the main board? One of the things to keep in mind is this was an analog mixer. Uh, so there was no firmware, there was no encryption, there was none of these magic things that we assume everything has now. Mm -hmm. uh, this was good old analog electronics that you could look at that circuit board and pretty much know how it worked. Yeah. Uh, it was not hard to figure out. It had silk screen that said, you know, copyright Mackie or whatever. And it had the silk screen would even define back then they didn't make as much effort to sort of obfuscate circuitry. Nowadays you'll find where companies will actually source chips that aren't labeled and do weird things to make it harder to reverse engineer. Back then, there wasn't as much of that. You, they were buying parts that, you know, the resistors had the color code on them. You could look and see what the what the value of that resistor was. And if you didn't know how to read the color code, a lot of times it would say right on the circuit board what the what the value was. Right. So yeah. You, or you could you could just get the schematics or, or yeah. uh, you know, the diagram. So, you know, you could fix these these things because they actually made things to be repairable. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I later owned an arcade and repaired a bunch of arcade machines that even, you know, 30-year-old machines, you can get the schematics for those things, and, and you could you could build your own if you had access to, you know, some of the sort of weirder parts that are in them. Um, but, you know, in an analog mixer, none of the parts are weird. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to jump to the end here, but just because we've kind of alluded to it several times, you, you got to tell that, that, that story. The one about my friend. Yes. The one with the, the okay. broken thing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a I had a, a good friend. His name is Kyle. Uh, I worked with him on a couple of assembly lines there. Uh, it, he's, uh, he's now gone on to be a, a video game audio guy. He's made his whole career out of audio. And I actually lived with Kyle for a while. Uh, he was, he was the first time I moved out of my parents' house was, you know, this guy from the factory and, and we we moved into an apartment together and had great fun uh, working at that place and and sort of hanging out together. And, and Kyle uh, was a very ambitious guy, and he had used the Mackie um, employee discount on the scratch and dent sort of B-stock and C-stock merchandise to build an entire studio in his dad's basement in Snohomish, Washington. He had this this really awesome uh, you know, full on professional quality studio. He had an HDR 2496. He had a digital eight bus. He had all of this recording gear and he had a band, um, that they recorded their own album there. He recorded some other local bands there. Uh, he was, he was just an audio nut. He was just into it. And, um, in his giant pile of gear, uh, he had this Behringer, uh, you know, 1604 clone. And he acquired this, you know, it was probably a, you know, eBay deal or something back then. I, I don't know. Like, it, I, I don't even, I doubt he bought it new. But at some point, he needed a cheap mixer to go to a gig or something. And so he picked one of these up. And at some point, it failed. And uh, it was a channel board that had failed, I think, if I remember right. And he popped that channel board out of that Behringer mixer and took it to the assembly line in our factory that made 1604s. And I think the technician that he that he talked to, I think it was Qua. I think that was I think that was the name of the technician. I, if I remember the story right, that's who it was. He walked up to him, and this guy had been working on this particular board for many years, like since this thing had come out. And um, you know, the technicians that worked on those boards, you know, some of them just worked on one board all the time. Some of them bounced around and worked on different lines. But this is a person who's an absolute expert on this particular circuit board, and. So Kyle walked up and said, hey, this is from my mixer at home. Could you fix this for me real quick? It's got a dead channel or whatever. And he said, oh, sure, Kyle. And he pulled it onto his bench and fixed it real quick and started to hand it back to him. And then he said, wait a minute. And he pulled it back and he realized it said Behringer. So this is a guy that looks at this circuit board every day of his life, 10 hours a day, and stares up close under a magnifying glass at it. He can take it and replace parts on it without knowing that it was the ripped off Behringer board. So that's how identical it was. They had ripped off the silk screen and the layout and everything. They didn't make any effort to hide what they had done. It was just a copy. So that's kind of the reason I wanted to jump ahead and, and tell that story is because I don't think anything could possibly underscore more the degree to which they ripped off Maggie. 
Like, I, I, you can say, oh, they ripped off Mackie. Oh, they just made a 16 channel mixer that was four buses. Ah, what's the big deal? No, no, no. They ripped off the circuit design to the point that a Mackie tech who's used to working on that board didn't realize he was working on a Behringer board until he had already fixed it. <laughs> yeah, it would be like if you took a part off of your Chevy to a Ford dealership <laughs> and had their maintenance tech look at it and he didn't understand that it wasn't, you know, one of theirs. Or right. I mean, it's a crazy story. Yeah. So Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah. So with that level of of just complete ripping off, what 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 happened? Why why wasn't it possible for Mackie to get damages out of out of Behringer? Well, I think that um, I don't know the whole story. Uh, I know that a lot of it is sort of publicly out there. You can research this and get way nerdy into what went wrong with this case. But, uh, you know, it's my understanding that the court just kind of tossed it like it wasn't um, something that was defendable. It was, uh, you know, if 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 you can you know, take the screws off of a mixer and pull the circuit board out and look at it and know how to build one. Um, at that time, in that case, the way that they tried to defend it, it was determined that Behringer hadn't really done anything wrong legally. Um, there was even, I, I think, a push that, if nothing else, copying the silk screen might have been the copyright violation. Just the little white lines on the circuit board maybe could have been a thing that was defensible, but it it wasn't. Like, there wasn't... Um, there wasn't any recourse for Mackey. And, you know, maybe that's partly because of Mackey was sort of, you know, expanding quickly, acquiring other companies. You know, we had we had just chaos going on in the marketplace with, you know, 9-11 and all this other stuff. And and I'm jumbling up the timeline there. This didn't all happen in the same year, but it was a, a sequence of events that led to those decisions to outsource that that factory to China. It was a it was a series of events that sort of led us there. But you have to wonder what would have happened differently had this Behringer thing not happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot easier to, you know, say, hey, this is made in America by, you know, people that are working right alongside with the design engineers. We've got, you know, this great quality product. You can make the argument that it should be worth a few more bucks unless you can get literally the exact same product for cheaper. Yeah. Like exact down to the down to the circuit. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I personally probably would try to direct it, you know, try to direct my money that way. I do that with, with DeWalt, I think. And that's actually what started this conversation is we were talking in, in the channel, I think, uh, what, two weeks ago, something like that about DeWalt, how they make some of their stuff in the, in the U S they assemble some of their stuff in the U S which is at least one step closer to actually being made in the U S anyway. Um, but that's what actually, actually, you know, sparked my, my mind to, to, to having you on, uh, you know, to, to retell that story. Um, so I, how do I put this? Well, so, okay. Take, take us then through, okay. After all that stuff, then what happened at Mackie? If after, you know, so Behringer's doing all this stuff, uh, everything's moving over overseas, you know, from a, from a production line standpoint. So what was the situation where people, was people hair on fire? Oh my God, what's going on? Or what was it like? Um, I mean, I witnessed a lot of tragedy, really, in it, all around me. There was, um, you know, these Vietnamese and Laotian and Korean families working at this place. Uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, Grandma Nora on the HDR 2496 line. She had worked for Mackie for 10 years or something. And all she knew how to do was build these things, you know, and, and she was so great at it. She was a great assembler. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, her her sons worked on that assembly line. Yeah. Uh, Sean and, and uh, Mike, they, they worked on that assembly line too. And so, you know, these families suddenly had issues with, you know, uh, immigration status and all this kind of stuff as that factory was winding down and they're laying people off. Um, the best technician that I ever worked with in 22 years of working with technology was named Tree, and he was the dropout technician for that line. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Tree right before the factory closed, and I asked him what he was going to go do, and he said he thought he was going to, you know, work at a gas station or something. He didn't know where to go. Oh, my God. Uh, and he was he was fantastic. I mean, this guy 
could do uh, component level diagnosis and repair on circuit boards without the schematics, without the design. I mean, you could just hand him stuff. And he just knew how everything was supposed to work. He was just one of those guys that he sort of had a sixth sense for it. And, you know, I watched him fix an issue one time with a can of freeze spray, and he showed me this sort of magic trick with it. And I, I looked, <laughs> I've, I've used it since then many times. Uh, uh, it was that kind of a place where you got to learn stuff like that on a daily basis. Uh, but, you know, I remember the day when the NASDAQ delisting happened. That was a sad day. I remember the waves of layoffs. It was any time, any day of the week, any time. You just, we knew that the factory was going to zero. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, you, you would wonder, you know, which 50 or 100 of your friends was going to get laid off, you know, this month or whatever. And the supervisors were told, you know, on a half a day's notice or whatever, hey, you need to make a list of 20 people, they're gone. And try to keep the people that have the sort of knowledge to keep the lines going. And it, it just became this this chaotic mess. Wow. So even even my friend Tom, who was one of Mackey's first employees, got laid off uh, in that era. So it was something to see. Absolutely, yeah. So have you have you spoken to anybody that's that's still at the uh, still at Mackey? So Tom was my main connection to the place uh, for a long time. He became, you know, kind of one of my best friends and. And, you know, now that he's passed away, I've, I've kind of lost my connection to some of those people. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, Vietnamese and Laotian people, I didn't, uh, you know, so many of them, their lives changed so dramatically. They probably, you know, weren't even living in that area anymore. A few of them I did run into from time to time. Uh, I know that, you know, my, my buddy uh, Sean, who was on that line as a tester, he last I knew was working as a... A table games dealer at a at a casino up in Washington. Wow! Uh, but it's uh, you know it, it. We thought that I thought I don't know what everybody else thought, but I thought that I was going to just do that kind of work for my whole life. Wow! And we found that that wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. We would go to job interviews. We'd sit in the waiting room, and you'd look around, and you'd see a bunch of people that you worked with at Mackey sitting in that same waiting room, trying to get the same seat in the same factory down the road. I was never able to sort of get into. I didn't have the the uh, college part and uh, I didn't get into the medical devices. There's still some medical device manufacturing around, but everything else disappeared. Hmm. So have you heard of any of that starting to come back in the last, you know, not, not, not even just the last four years, but in the last several years, have you heard about any of that starting to come back or? Yeah, there are interesting things that happen uh, more now. And of course, I've moved on and I, you know, I work as an IT engineer now. But and I did a bunch of other stuff in between. I was a low voltage electrician and did other things. But um, I do now get contacted by recruiters looking to hire me to work in an electronics factory in Woodenville, Washington. So a little bit of something's going on, but usually it's that medical stuff or mm -hmm aerospace stuff you know of course boeing is up there and so there's a lot of jobs for that kind of stuff uh of course boeing is really in bad shape right now so uh you know there's there's some ups and downs to all of those things uh the last time i had an interview for that type of work up there before i moved it there was an ultrasound uh it was an ultrasound probe repair place that was right down the road from where the Mackey factory had been hmm. uh it was uh they they were looking for people that could repair the inner stuff in an ultrasound probe and i went and interviewed for that the guy that did my solder test uh you know the guy that administered my you know i they said do you know how to solder under a microscope and i said yes even though i didn't and i went and soldered some connections under a microscope the guy that looked at my connections to see if they were good or not mm -hmm. He turned and looked at me and said, you worked at Mackey, didn't you? <laughs> and so turned out, you know, 18 years later or whatever, huh. he was a, a guy that had worked at Mackey. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a thing, actually. Like, people are able to tell who worked on a certain thing just by, you know, the, the way that something is soldered. Was there a special way that people soldered things at Mackey? Was that, there like a standard... <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I think he actually recognized me. Hmm. Uh, but he uh, he wasn't sure, and and then once we talked about products we worked on, then then he was sure. But uh, you know, I did get surface mount soldering certified uh, at Mackey. They had their own internal certification, and I, I did get that back then. So 
there probably is some style in there that came from that training. That's really cool. Yeah, they can even use that, uh, I, I, from what I understand, in, um, uh, like, if they find an explosive device or something like that, they can look at the way that wires are connected together and kind of build a, a basically a fingerprint of who likely made that. Like, you know, after they, you know, if they find uh, uh, several things in your particular shed in the middle of North Dakota, they, <laughs> they can go back and say, oh, this guy here also, you know, these devices here were also probably made by that same guy in that same shed in North Dakota. That, that microscope soldering test was really a weird thing because the wire in an ultrasound probe is so tiny. I mean, it's like a human hair or whatever. Wow. And you're trying to make these little tiny solder joints. And actually the, the technician lead for that place, he pulled me aside and he said, I know you lied. I know you've never done this before. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, your first connection was terrible. Your second one would have worked. And your third one, I would have let go out the door. It would have been fine. He's like, you must have done a lot of this at some point. I said, well, I used to work right down the road at Mackey. And then, and then he kind of, then he kind of understood that that's, I mean, that whole area in that neighborhood, if you were an electronics technician, a tester, an assembler, any of that kind of stuff, if you worked, you know, in the late nineties or early two thousands, you probably worked there at some point. That's amazing. So Looking back then, you know, now it's it's a lot easier to 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 look back and say, OK, well, you know, if only we would have done this or that or whatever. Right. Uh, is there something that could have been done in order to to move things in a different direction in order to save those jobs, in order to to keep the quality up, all that stuff? Is is that is there something that could have been done to do that? Uh <laughs> Nothing from my point of view uh, as the tester in the factory, but uh, certainly um, I think that Mackey got on its heels and was sort of backpedaling for that last era of their American manufacturing sort of, you know, that, that time that I worked there and maybe a year or two before that. I think that they were in a situation where, uh, you know, they were, they were a little behind their competitors. Uh, the the engineering problems that they had going to China, uh, I think ultimately kind of killed the brand. I mean, you still, you know, see Mackey with the little running man and not the name, but I mean, those are everywhere. And so that product is still successful. Uh, but the company as we knew it certainly died, uh, you know, in that era right when I left. Uh, and I think that a lot of that was due to the quality issues they had going to China. So. Uh, I wish that they hadn't been trying to acquire those other companies. I think that put them in a, in a weaker spot. I wish we would have figured out a way to buy transducers and speakers without buying the manufacturers that made those things. Uh, because I think that that kind of tapped them out. I think that the digital products were cool and they, we came out with some really great stuff, but I think it was kind of too much too fast and they, you know, they, they had always been designing analog stuff. They didn't know the ins and outs of digital yet. Mm -hmm. I think that if they would have legged into that a little bit slower and maybe not invested in some of the things they invested in, maybe they could have survived to sort of fight another day and maybe it would have been different. I don't know. Yeah. Because when you have a, uh, when, when you have a completely different set of skills, which is what you would need for that, right? You know, if you're, if you are going from uh, through hole manufacturing all the way into the world where you need to make your own OS for a thing, that's a, that's a significant like skill up tool up, you know, that's a significant I increase to your, your costs in general. So it's, so it sounds to me like you're, you know, you, if you could go back in time and, and someone waves a magic wand and says, come here, kid, Get off that testing line. You're in charge of Mackie now. You know, if you could do that, uh, it sounds to me like your prescription would be go with what you know. You guys do analog really well. Stick with that. You brought the company to do that. Do that. I think that we needed to move into digital stuff. I mean, I think that they've had successful digital products. Yeah. To be honest, I don't really follow audio stuff anymore because it's sort of depressing to me in a way. But I, believe, um, yeah. I think that they needed some they needed some digital products, but I think that they started with like the biggest digital product thing ever was the D8B. 
and the digital eight bus was a crazy piece of engineering uh, and it worked pretty well i mean it was a it was a good product and you still see those out there sometimes mm -hmm. in venues and stuff uh, and the hdr was another just massive undertaking i think that there was just so many of those things there was just i think that you maybe could have legged into to digital a little slower uh, at least from my point of view in the factory i don't know the business side of things i don't know the stock market side of things and all the you know trade agreements and all that other stuff but yeah. from my point of view in the factory it was just too chaotic trying to do all of that at once and figure out all at once that you know the like i said even just the esd issues i mean once you start grounding people then you've got safety issues to deal with you, you know i i had to tap a, a test engineer lead on the shoulder one day and say you know, the guy doing the high pot test, the 3000 volt test at the end of the line, he shouldn't be wearing an ESD wrist strap because if that unit fails that test and he touches it, he's going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And well, they didn't know that stuff. They had never dealt with it before. So I don't know. It's hard to say what would have been different, but I think that taking it easy on that, that ultra fast move into digital but they had to do that partly because of the behringer thing i mean they were like i say they were on their heels they were fighting for their life at that point yeah so so i guess that to tie in with our main theme there that is kind of an interesting thing especially when we get to the second subject because right around that time is right when the dmca the digital millennial copyright act came out right <laughs> So yeah. as they are putting the flipping screws, I mean, you want to hear a sad story. I should tell you guys sometimes about Bismarck E and the crap that he went through. Uh, uh, the song, It's Spring Again, I'll tell you now. This, uh, there was a song called It's Spring Again, and he sampled, <clears throat> he sampled just a little piano loop from somewhere. It's like not that big of a part of the song. And at the time, sampling was just fine. Like it was, it was, yes, you are infringing copyright but no one cared well this was one of the first songs where someone cared and they nailed him to the flipping wall it was terrible yeah. like what they did to bismarcky that's one of the reasons that like well i don't know i don't want to i don't want to speculate like that but he, he was in bad financial shape for a long time is basically where i'm going with that it, and it's sad because he, he was like one of the legends of of hip-hop like absolute legend and you know but for him to be starving because some guy, you know, sued him over a couple seconds worth of piano loop. Was it within his rights to do so? Yeah, but you could have worked it out to where it was like a share of the profits or something like that. You don't need to hurt him like that. But anyway. Be being a Linux guy trying to play DVDs on a Linux box in that era, I was very familiar with the DMCA. Mm. And until you said it, I had never really thought about that being kind of the same era. And I wonder if that drove Mackie to be digital a little bit after the analog circuitry got ripped off by Behringer. Maybe they wanted to move to a product that had its own OS that could be protected in that way. That's interesting. I had never really thought about that. Very well could be. But at the, but at the time, the way it was, though, was, was that music was just, you know, and, and technology and, and DVDs. Oh, my God, the DVD code thing. Oof. But, you know, the screws were getting tightened on that. But at the same time, an electronics manufacturer in America is able to have his whole entire board design completely ripped off, you know, to the point where <laughs> it still just boggles my mind that a technician is able to work on a board by a different manufacturer and doesn't realize he's doing it. Like, yeah. just in, just astounding. Well, uh, yeah, I, thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, any final thoughts before we uh, before we sign off for, for this hour? We do have the post game coming up, but I wanted to... Anybody want the last word here? No, I, I suppose back in that day, like it's probably uh, you know a two-layer board as well for that. So inc that's incredibly easy to copy. Yeah, for the for the analog boards, I don't know specifically, but I'm pretty sure you're right. I'm pretty sure a lot of those were two-layer boards. Uh, certainly later on, we had some stuff that was multi-layer and and. I think that when we bought Acuma Labs for that sync board in the HDR 2496, I think that that might have been the most layers that had ever been on one of our boards, but I don't remember how many. Hmm. Anything before we head out? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Nothing for me. Cool, cool. Well, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to sort of rehash my uh, 
my favorite era of my career that was uh, two decades ago. Absolutely. No, I, like I said, we, we, uh, we went to a, a local restaurant here like about a year ago. And he, he told me that he told me like, I think it was the two or three hour version of this story. And it's, <laughs> it is just freaking fascinating because I was able to watch it from the street level and to hear it from, from, you know, the actual level of someone that was actually involved in it was just, just so cool. I thank you so much for doing that. Are you able to stick around for the post game? I can, I can. And you know, th this was an opportunity when I, when I went to work at Mackey that came to me because of John Kerry was a, was a floor supervisor there changed my whole life. And that's how these things work. If you get an opportunity to work in a place like that, jump on it. It'll change your life. You don't mean John Kerry, like presidential candidate. No. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I was like, when was John Kerry in Seattle? That's what? <laughs> Oh, now I get it. No, that's, that's awesome. Like there's, there's, there's always those people that, that just give you the littlest bit of help along the way. And it just changes your whole life. That's, that's really cool. So, so here's to John Kerry. Here's, to, here's to one of the real ones. That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break and then we're going to come back and I'm going to tell you all about our copyright, uh, uh, struggles and how I got away with it. The answer just may surprise you. Uh, so thanks again for, for joining us for the, for the main show, uh, to you people who will watch this later on YouTube, you missed it. It's on, it was on Twitch. It was awesome. By the way, the second hour was, was, was just phenomenal. The first hour, it was every bit as good as the first. It was amazing, but you know, you missed it. But so do the people on Twitch, it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, stick around with us and we will be right back in about five, maybe 10 minutes, depending on how long it takes us to get a drink. So, uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and sign off uh, for right now. Join us back right here. About five, ten minutes. I am the Mighty Pong. I'm Crux. Is that a fi? Ugly man. And we will see you right here in about five, ten minutes. Be right back. Hi, I'm the Mighty Pong, host of the show that you just got done watching. Hey, if you'd like to see the entire show and not just the first hour, make sure that you watch on twitch.tv forward slash sin shop every Friday night for the main show. And on Monday nights, we have our special project night. So you can join us, build something, and uh, basically throw stuff at us while we try to concentrate on things. It's a lot of fun. Kind of. But hey, anyway, we hope to see you there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so join us over there. Twitch.tv forward slash sin shop. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and we will see you there. One take. Not one.